Hi there. Before we begin, I'd just like to welcome uh, general public and audiences into this uh, inaugural Asian Drama Turks Network Symposium. As you know, some of you know that we had a closed door meeting this morning. It was really productive, very meaningful. Uh, uh, I'm afraid we did have to make a decision to have it closed door because there was quite a few of us involved in intimate discussions, which would, <laughs> and it was interesting discussion, uh, uh, that wouldn't really uh, benefit a, 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 an audience of this sort, which is why uh, for this particular session and a few others, we do have a more structured, no less interesting uh, panels. So very quickly, I'd like to welcome you guys back for those who were here this morning and welcome to those who are just beginning uh, this uh, journey with us. So very quickly this afternoon, to start us off, we're going to be looking at this title called Talking Dramaturgy and the Dramaturg uh, with a subtitle of Looking for an Asian Context. And even though I did come up with the title, it's a little, yeah, the whole idea was to even question whether we do need to or is there one of an Asian context. So very quickly, I just want to introduce our panelists and myself. I'm Hao Nian. I will be moderating this particular session. So let's go from extreme left. Extreme left, we have Shintaro Fuji who is Professor in Theatre Studies and currently the Chief of the Department of Theatre and Film Studies at Waseda University in Tokyo, Japan. He specializes in contemporary performing arts with a focus on Francophone countries such as France, Belgium and Canada and Japan, of course. He works on dramaturgy of the works of prominent artists such as Romeo Castellucci, Alain Platel, Robert Lepage and Dumb Type. Next, we have Ms. Uh, Dr. Nanako Nakajima. Nanako is a scholar and a dramaturg of dance and a certified traditional Japanese dance master. She currently teaches at Aichi University in Japan, but is also a research fellow at Free University in Berlin. She was a postdoctoral research fellow of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science at Saitama University. And she was at Jacob's Pillow Research, uh, Jacob Phil, uh, Pillow research Fellow and a visiting scholar at Tisch School, New York University. I am just going to give brief introductions as our illustrious panelists for the today and the rest of this entire event, the CVs and the achievements really run quite long. So please uh, refer to the bookets or programs that have been given out. Last but not least, we have Peter Eckersall, Professor of Asian Theatre at the Graduate Center at City University of New York. Uh, he has recently, uh, his recent publications include We Are People Who Do Shows, Back-to-Back uh, -back Theater, Performance, Politics, Visibility, and quite a few others. Uh, Peter was a graduate at the Rusden Theater Program and co-founded The Men Who Knew Too Much, a performance group that was active for much of the 1980s and 1990s. More recently, he was the co-founder of Dramaturgies and is the resident dramaturg for the performance group Not Yet It's Difficult, NYID. NYID's award-winning performance and mixed media works have been widely seen in Australia, Asia and Europe. So without further ado, I'd like uh, to invite uh, Shintaro to start us off. Uh, each speaker will have 20 minutes. And then after that, we'll open it for discussion and Q&A to the floor. Shintaro, thank you. OK. Um, can I have the PowerPoints? Um, I don't know how it, how it works. Would it be better if uh, Nanako and Shintaro Would it help if you guys switch places? <laughs> um, or are you okay there? Um, it's, yeah. So. Yes. 
Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much, um, first of all, um, to the organizers in Singapore. Um, I'm very much honored and excited to take part in this um, inaugural symposium of Asian Drum Turks Network. Thank you. Um, so um, I, I teach at Waseda University in Tokyo um, in theater studies department. And, um, and I, I, I'm not really a specialist of dra uh, dramaturgy um, in a practical sense, even though I dramaturged um, one or two times. And then um, I, I've been doing um, dramaturgical things without being called a dramaturg. Um, but anyway, um, here are some um, uh, theoretical um, contribution um, that I might be able to make. Um, I, I first, so it's, to, I, I would like to, like I say, I would like to make a, a small remark. Um, dramaturgy is a very funny concept in this post-dramatic age when drama is less and less synonymous with theater. The prefix drama sounds very, very old fashioned. And the term performance is more and more often preferred to that of theater. Isn't it strange that genres such as dance, circus, opera, which by definition are not dramatic at all, hire more and more dramaturgs? <laughs> it, it, it is striking that drama, dramaturgs as a physical person and Interest in dramaturgy and symposia and the publication on dramaturgy are affluent in the contemporary theater landscape. Um, so here is um, some, a list of some big name artists in Europe um, and in North America um, that are working with um, dramaturgs. And a list of um, recent publications in English and in French, um, th this is my uh, first remark. And then when you try to uh, think about dramaturgy, everyone agrees indeed that dramaturgy is a very tricky object, difficult to discern or define because of its polysemy that the term acquired with history and because of the quite important differences according to languages, cultures, theaters, and artists. I'm a specialist of performing arts in Francophone countries like such as France, Belgium, and Canada. And in these countries, the notion and the practice of production dramaturgy is quite recent. That dates back to 1960s approximately. And there are almost no house dramaturgs in institutionalized theaters unlike in Germany, which has a tradition of institutional dramaturgs that started two and a half centuries ago uh, with Lessing, um, who wrote his Hamburgish dramaturgy um, in 18th century. Another source of possible confusion, um, dramaturgy can be found on different levels and be attributed to different people. First, dramaturgy can be discussed on the level of um, a written text, dramaturgs in the sense of playwright. And etymolo etymologically, um, like um, it, it, was, it was remarked this morning, dramaturgos in ancient Greek meant playwright. Dramaturge, dramaturge in modern French, like in many other European languages, still means both playwright and dramaturg. Second, on the level of performance, it is in the sense related to the collective work of a director, choreographer, a dramaturg, and actors and dancers. This is in fact close to the idea of mise en scène or directing. Bernard Docht, um, a French um, theater specialist, um, says he does not make any difference between mise en scène um, in the theoretical sense and dramaturgy. Matthias Langhoff, a German director, 
theater maker also says he doesn't make distinctions between dramaturgy, uh, mise en scène, and decor. This usage is a little confusing uh, because usually uh, the author of a performance is a director or a choreographer, even, th even if this authorship of a performance can sometimes be questionable. So the dramaturgy of a performance is more attributed to the director choreographer with eventually his or her dramaturg rather than to the dramaturg alone. And to make things mo even more complicated, as Patrice Pavis states, it also belongs to the spectator. Then, um, and then um, there was um, Brecht um, uh, after the Second World War, uh, who inseminated the idea and the practice of production dramaturgy all over Europe. And uh, then, since 1980s, there is a shift from the Brechtian concept dramaturgy, or the old dramaturgy, to a more contemporary, process-oriented, new dramaturgy. Um, the term is um, are taken from the Marianne van Kerkhoven, um, the famous um, Flemish dramaturg. The new dramaturgy was born when the field of theater is, was expanding, um, having gone through the um, Einsteinian revolution, um, according to the expression of Bernard Docht, on one hand, and and on, on one hand, with the anthropolo an anthropological understanding of theater led to include extra-European forms of theater into the theater. And on the other, um, post-dramatic forms were I say, very much developing. But in fact, these two dramaturgies, textual and performative, uh, sorry, wrong slide. Um, textual and performative are not so different as they seem to. Eugenio Barba um, does not, but defines both in the same terms as the work of the actions in the performance. That is, the way different elements are woven into a performance, which can be considered as a text. And um, text etymologically meant weaving. These are both um, so. These are both a structure of the composition. Dramaturgy has always uh, something to do with the structures. It is about controlling the whole. Um, the expression is again um, from Marianne van Kerkhoven. And so, it's, and this definition um, common to um, textual and performative dramaturgy can hold true uh, for the third um, um, for the third definition of dramaturgy, which concerns the curatorial activities of house dramaturgs of a theater of a festival, like we discussed this morning. This dramaturgy is related to the team of intendant and dramaturgs, producers, who decide the directing principle of the activities of their theater. The term may be specifically related to the profession of dramaturg. Um, there are degree programs in, in Germany or in France um, um, called dramaturgy de department, which, um, which train um, the future dramaturgs uh, separate, um, separately uh, from th that for the um, directors. And we also find usages um, as sociological metaphors, as we discussed a little bit this morning too, to make things even more complicated. So um, to recapitulate, dramaturgy can belong to um, uh, a playwright or a director or a theater with, with its intendant and dramaturgs or a dramaturg proper or any individual group, society, or a spectator so it's, there is no wonder it is um, complicated to understand what dramaturgy is. And then I wanted to um, raise one point. It is possible and sometimes useful to distinguish a dramaturg from a dr dramaturgical function, 
which does not necessarily um, be fulfilled by a dramaturg. Not only dramaturgs are responsible for dramaturgy. Again, Bernard Ocht um, stresses the importance of nurturing the collective consciousness, the dramaturgical thinking, rather than creating a post of a dr dramaturg. And Alison uh, just made um, a remark um, at the end of the morning session, and I was really surprised um, how, how, how she could um, anticipate my, <laughs> my, my talk, um, collective consciousness and dramaturgical thinking. These were the words I prepared um, consciously. And then, um, so it is very much possible um, that there is dramaturgy where there is no dramaturg. And yeah, in some countries, um, uh, we discussed in this morning in Indonesia, for example, um, there are people uh, doing, uh, effectuating uh, and dramaturgical functions uh, without being called a dramaturg. In Japan too, because um, the appearance or some, um, of dramaturg is quite recent. It only it's only for the past twenty years, um, and but. Even before that, there was a dramaturgical functions which was done by others who were never called a dramaturg. And then, um, so it's, um, there's an, another um, dramaturg, a Flemish woman, um, Miriam van Inshoort, uh, who, who was saying that you do, not, you do not need a dramaturg to achieve the dramaturgical. And I totally agree with her. And we can think of some um, examples of collective dramaturgy without a dramaturg. Um, I can think, um, think of T.J. Stan from Flanders, um, Mats Happe, Discordia, um, and um, Van Inschot was citing the name of Boris Schachmat, um, a French choreographer, and I can add um, Jérôme Bell uh, or L'Amica de Production. Um, in France, there are many artists uh, who don't work um, with a specific dramaturgs, but um, their works show a very, very interesting um, dramaturgical points. And um, and then I guess um, let's move on. Um, I, I would like to talk about um, contemporary dramaturgy. What interests me personally in the contemporary performing arts and in the contemporary performance dramaturgy. It is in the sense of dramaturgy of a spectator. And th my first point is um, it concerns um, the activation of a spectatorship, the presence of the audience. The spectator is a part of the performance and the dramaturgy takes the audience more, and more into consideration. And um, we know that um, in visual arts, uh, since the, um, relational aesthetics um, by, written by Nicola Brio um, in 1998, um, relationship with the audience is becoming an in integral part of some artworks. There has always been, um, and, and then uh, theater, even before as a visual arts, Theatre has always been relational, and it is even because it is becoming even more so in contemporary theatre. There are more and more participatory performances that require physical actions of the audience and um, because, um, reflections, um, asking for reflections from the audience, seeking a sort of, of emancipation of the spectator, according to the title um, of a book written by Jacques Rancière. I recall that Situation Rooms, um, a performance done by Rimini Protocol, where 20 spectators, um, each coming into a three-dimensional set, uh, it is actually a sort of a building, and they each uh, come, um, come from a different entrance, guided by the virtual images on the iPads, and each will be eventually playing a role for 19 other spectators who are say, becoming actors, actually. 
and there are no professional actors in this performance except virtual ones you see on the iPad. And th second point is that um, that is what I would call um, dramaturgy of screen. Um, that means sort of um, a dialectic of image and screen. Um, the distinct, I, I take these terms um, in reference to the um, theory of Jacques Lacan um, in psychoanalysis. Dialectic of showing and hiding, and it, that is very theatrical. I am um, thinking of um, such artists um, as, as Romeo Castellucci, Giselle Vienne, Joël Pomra, who present clear cut, very aesthetic images on stage, yet intentionally left opaque. The image is also serving as a screen that hides something behind. Giselle Vienne puts her work in parallel with the writing of Alain, Alain Robegurier, um, um, it, it, you know, um, the, um, the writer uh, who, who is usually assimilated with um, nouveau roman, new novels. Talking about um, Giselle is talking about the need not to let the audience understand everything. So something should remain enigmatic. Otherwise, the audience will be bored. I also remember Romeo Castellucci uh, defines uh, theatrical communication as a non-communication. Um, the theatrical communication shouldn't um, function as um, um, in, in the mode of normal communication in a society. A last remark, um, in this mo movement, the new performative dramaturgy brings about a change in the nature of textual dramaturgy. The status of text or a piece of theater has been radically changing. A text is of, often now written during or, and, or after, um, sorry, um, a text is often written during and or completed after the working progress pro, um, process, collective pr uh, creation. The text is more and more integrated into a multi and intermediate performance. So it's, um, again, um, to I say, what I said about um, I say, the definition of dramaturgy by uh, Eugenio Barba, um, performative dramaturgy and texture dramaturgy are I say, influencing each other. It, that, that, um, we shouldn't make um, too much distinction between the two. And um, to conclude, to finish, um, we can safely say that dramaturgy is in the heart of a large transma transformation process of theater. It's, um, it is in the heart of the transformation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for laying out quite a foundational map, actually, for the rest of us to think on and to then continue on this chat. Um, now I will invite Peter to continue. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, also just to extend my thanks to the organizers and say what a pleasure it is to be here and talk about this uh, complex topic of dramaturgy. Um, I'm going to follow on from um, Shintaro's paper a little bit and in some ways I'm going to kind of shadow the paper and introduce some of the same ideas from a slightly different perspective, I think. Um, uh, I'm very much aware of the fact that this is an exercise in mapping, but um, I was thinking also of uh, another critical term introduced by Uchino Tadashi called zapping. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, many years ago, about 10 years ago, uh, Uchino wrote a, quite an influential essay on essentially a mapping of 1960s avant-garde performance into the present day. And he called this essay Mapping and Zapping. And mapping su suggests a certain kind of uh, relationship to idea, uh, perhaps uh, uh, li con lines connecting ideas, a certain kind of spatial or temporal relationship. 
zapping offers the possibility of going into a black hole and then just reappearing somewhere else. It, it, it creates uh, perhaps slightly less uh, obvious connections and, it, and in some ways I think um, creates the possibility for things to coexist even though we don't quite know how they do. And this somehow speaks, I think, to an important concept of dramaturgy. Um, it leads us to a number of critical tools too and giving, uh, uh, sorry, um, critical terms. Uh, which I think have already been introduced and foreground in the paper that we've heard and will continue to be discussed in, in the following paper. Um, the, the ways we might describe this, might, you might use different words, but it strikes me that the word network is very important. Uh, dramaturgy as a practice, is, is both as a, as a theory and a practice, is always imbricated in a certain kind of network of relations. Um, it enables and, and, and comes, arises from collaboration, contestation, and disruption. And so all of those terms were, I think, introduced this morning in this morning's discussions. It also makes me think of the term apparatus and uh, some of the conversations we were having about uh, both the existence of dramaturgy as a cultural practice or as a, as, a, as a production practice within the context of contemporary performance making, maybe in Singapore, for example, there's something very much apparatus-like about the existence of dramaturgy. This means that we are introduced to notions of systems. This means that we're introduced to various regimes that might teach us how to do dramaturgy. But it also means that these, like, an, like you know, the kind of Agamben notion of the apparatus, it's, it's something that we don't really want to keep too close to us. It's, uh, uh, it's, it suggests a certain kind of closure and a certain kind of uh, possibility for surveillance, almost. Um, so. Uh, moving on to these, uh, on from these critical terms, I, I want to sort of elaborate on David Pledge's discussion of dramaturgy as an operating system and think of it uh, how we think about an operating system existing within a cultural system and thinking about how dramaturgy starts to bridge those two, those two possibilities. Um, Dramaturgy for me and also for you know, my teachers is, and, and for the work that I've always done with, with people like David in NYID has always been a bridging process. It's always been about bridging something or other, bringing together people, ideas, critical practices, politics, uh, performance forms uh, in the context of live performance and sometimes media. So for me, dramaturgy is always a bridging practice. It's always between things. It's always, uh, I think in Marianne van Kerkhoven's uh, terminology, a space of becoming. You know, she talks a lot about the possibility, or she used to, um, talk about dramaturgy as always being something that was malleable to this idea of bridging uh, possibly discrete and sometimes oppositional practices. So there's a very strong framework around dramaturgy as a bridging practice, but that also means that there's also this somewhat um, flexible understanding of what it means. And, and this opens it up to the possibility of these kind of critical terms like network, like assemblage that I've been discussing. Dramaturgy is also about addressing the wider conditions of society and culture and relating those conditions to performance. I think that's something that we've all acknowledged this morning. Um, but that also means that there are new possibilities for dramaturgy, I think, to operate in this, uh, uh, shall we say, extra theatrical or extra performative dimension and this cultural dimension. And, um, uh, you know, I overheard a, a slightly funny conversation from some curators the other day at an art gallery where they were lamenting the fact that all they seem to do these days is make conferences and symposia. Um, <laughs> and um, in a way, I think dramaturgs are moving into this kind of practice as well. So we can think about the work we do in a production context, but we can also think about the work we do more broadly in a kind of discursive space, in a space of the possibility where performance is uh, being represented as a form of research, as an ideas practice, uh, in relation to the broader cultural space. This, I would argue, is a dramaturgical process, and it should be seen as something that is part of the dramaturgy of performance. So. Um, that then gives us this notion, which I've used in the past, of uh, this being an expanded dramaturgy, something that expands from the possibility of the theatre and essentially zaps itself into all of these other critical political cultural spaces of, uh, of possibility and transformation. So, 
there is this very productive relationship then that is, in, that is held within the crucible of dramaturgical practice between artistic processes, be they performance processes, theatre processes or dance, uh, and other artistic processes, I'll argue in a minute, and this uh, wider cultural sphere. And the ways that those inter 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 interactions happen, I think, are explored sometimes by dramaturgs. They're also explored by other artists constantly, but dramaturgs very often come to a project with a view that they're interested in perhaps writing about those connections, developing those connections and making them not just visible in the act, critical act of making performance, but perhaps extending the life of that performance into some other critical sphere. So this aspect of dramaturgy, which is about perhaps debating and you know, actually creating conferences and symposia, as the curators were complaining about, perhaps moving into the sphere of creating other kinds of discursive events, bringing people together, and so on and so forth. The other idea I want to introduce is, I, you know, I, I think that contemporary theatre is inherently dramaturgical. And I, I, I don't, you know, I, what, I, what do I mean by this? I mean that contemporary theatre and, well, let's use the word performance, it's a more helpful critical term and, and perhaps artistic term because it's uh, perhaps more inclusive of the range of, uh, of performative uh, actions that are taking place in the world. Contemporary performance is dramaturgical because it has a very strong awareness of its own uh, uh, forms its own conversations, its own possibility for existence as a cultural form. And it's very often making those conversations, even if they're hesitant conversations about its uh, inherent politicality or its inherent uh, uh, enculturation or its inherent space of critical discourse, part of the production itself. It becomes visible in the operational logic of a work itself. A good example of this is um, a recent uh, film performance um, called Event for Stage, made by Tacita Dean, who uh, made a film work, essentially a, a two-camera film work, uh, which was performed live uh, at Carriage Works in Sydney and was also filmed live featuring the actor Stephen De uh, Delancey, who's uh, most well known for his work in Game of Thrones. Um, but actually is a very complex figure. He's a, in some ways an interstitial figure. He's between so many things. And in this performance, he essentially performs a performance where he's responding to texts that he's being fed by the film director live in the space, while also recounting his own life story or his own biography as somebody who was born in Australia but has worked for his whole life in England and has returned to Australia uh, um, to uh, um, um, pay respects to his, his dead father. And so there's layers of story that are being explored and perhaps exploited in this work that are made very visible to us as a spectator, as the audience. There's layers of, uh, of conversation about form. Are we watching a performance? I actually didn't see the work as, as the performance. I saw it as a film work uh, because the ultimate uh, work is shown now in an art gallery context as a live film work, but very interestingly, always shown using 16 millimeter film projections. So there's also a conversation about material, a materiality of, of film in this work. And the, and the work concentrates on this dialogue between the actor and the camera and the clapperboard and these multiple layers of story and the need that he, the fact that he has to respond both to this sort of insistent interruptions from the director who's giving him new pieces of text and the fact that film cameras have only something like 12 minutes of film in them and they run out. And at the end of that time, he has to pause his performance. Uh, in a live performance context and then uh, make the connection uh, to the next part of the story as they reload the film camera and move on to the next phase. So it's a very interesting film in the sense that it is a mediatized version of a performance which is really, I think, on one level, very much a conversation about dramaturgy. It's, it's all about the kind of networks of uh, story, material, uh, materiality, uh, form, uh, uh, context, all of which are kept alive at the same moment in this performance. It's uh, quite a stunning uh, piece of work. We also see 
I think, the proliferation of terms associated with dramaturgy. And uh, some of these are very helpful. Perhaps some of them are a little bit obscure. Um, I was reminded of my use of the word slow dramaturgy yesterday as one way to attempt to describe what I was seeing in the work that uh, Shintaro has really described uh, that came into this kind of new dramaturgical moment in Europe. I, I began to see this work. It looked very different to work that had happened before. I didn't really know how to describe it, and so I became fascinated with its dramaturgy, with in what, in what way was this form different to what had previously been uh, seen. And I, uh, 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 Eddie Patterson and I, a colleague from the University of Melbourne, tried to theorise this idea of slow dramaturgy. But we also have Cathy Turner's uh, work on architectural forms of dramaturgy, her connection of dramaturgy to space and urban uh, existence. Her own company in the UK takes people on these kind of encounters with urban space and they discover things uh, as they go along these journeys, which are both uh, tangible things like the existence of buildings and so on, but also the stories behind those buildings and the kind of micro histories that exist. How much more time have I got? Oh, excellent, good. I'll, have, I'll be finished before then. Um, Carol Martin has introduced the term dramaturgies of the real into our conversation, responding, I think, to a, a, a vast amount of work that, that has taken place in the last decade or more um, by companies like Rimini Protocol, but I think many, many other companies that are bringing in this sort of context of reality into the performance space. And we uh, have become a little bit, in a way, um, uh, less pleased with the idea of theatre, we're less pleased with the idea of acting, we're less able to uh, deal with the kind of reality of, or not the reality, but the, the kind of uh, the, the historical appendages of this fake form of, of people acting, putting on fake costumes, adopting fake accents, putting on all of these kind of uh, essentially uh, layers and layers and layers of, of, of mediated kind of resistance to the idea that you're just being there on the stage. And so now when we go to the theatre, very often we're not even sure we're watching theatre. We're watching people talk, we're watching people do lectures, we're watching people write stories, we're watching people film other people, we're watching people really have sex, we're watching people uh, suddenly talk and then, and then for no apparent reason dance. Um, we're watching a series of quite interesting, I think, in interruptions, but also in some ways all of these things are, are drawing attention to the kind of, you know, the dramaturgy of the real, the reality that's being depicted on the stage as an actual reality, as something that's being lifted from a kind of slice of life uh, um, uh, that, that uh, is then relocated into the theatrical space for uh, some kind of temporary rearrangement of those, those, those items, those experiences, those strips of behaviour, if you like, uh, for the purpose of the performance. There's no, there's no idea that this is another space, though. It's something that we bring uh, the, the real into and then the real continues beyond that space. And the, the idea that theatre interrupts that or is different to that or is, you know, kind of smiley face, frowning face or, you know, the kind of separation of the stage and the audience, that's, that's uh, something that has been challenged by these notions of the dramaturgy of the real. Um, I'm also interested in the kind of way in which new dramaturgy and, and this dramaturgy of the real has introduced, I think, a way of understanding uh, and I use this word, it's a very complicated word to use, but objective, uh, an objectiveness, uh, th this new kind of objectivity that is coming into uh, dramaturgical practice. So we see this, I think, very interestingly in the work of Okada Toshiki, for example, in Japan, um, but also Raimondo Cortesi in Australia is another artist who does this. Um, and there are many, many artists now, we see this in, 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 in the sense of introducing animals into performance in Castellucci's work or in Ivor Van Hover's work. There's always an opportunity to interrupt the kind of fictional stage with this kind of objective de depiction of something this objectification of an experience, this description of something that's happening, this uh, lifelike -like, uh, relationship to an objective reality. And I, I think this is very challenging because uh, uh, you know, objectification is something that we've been very critical of 
uh, in relation to the depiction of human subjects on the stage, for example, now for many decades. We're very concerned about, uh, 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 and I think especially in this context, in uh, you know, uh, so-called non-Western contexts where we're talking about dominant cultural practices in theatre, there is this history of objectification, for example, of Asian bodies in a, in a way that's quite uh, discriminatory. Um, but what I'm talking about here is much more a kind of Brechtian sense of, uh, of bringing some kind of awareness of an objective reality to the stage, some kind of distanciation. And so what I see dramaturgy doing in this is introducing processes of interruption, introducing processes of ways to remove the spectator from this uh, kind of imaginary world of the stage, and also empowering actors with the ability to actually be themselves or performers and present themselves on stage. But also we see a lot more people in uh, directing and so on and so forth who have a particular objective style. They develop uh, a, a critical voice and they explore that critical voice over uh, a number of works. The final thing I'm going to talk about very briefly is uh, new media dramaturgy, which is a, a concept we've been working on uh, in a research project that uh, my colleagues Selena Gray and Edward Shear and myself have been developing over the last couple of years. And here we're working uh, on and about and with a group of artists who uh, have taken their work into uh, object spaces, using objects in performance, using robots, using um, non-human elements as performance. And there's a lot of concern now about the way in which these, uh, these agents perform. Um, they certainly express, they certainly entertain, they certainly create contexts for conversation and ideas. Um, the artist Chris Verdonk, uh, says that his process is to listen to what these things want to do. So he doesn't try and over-determine the work by saying, I'm going to apply my artistic vision. He says, I'm going to observe this object in the space and I'm going to find out what it wants to do. Now, this is, a, I mean, an interesting way to describe an artistic process, but it's also interesting from the point of view of this idea of this kind of new form of objectivity. If we approach theatre from the point of view of thinking, well, what do these people want to do? What does this thing want to do? What do these stories want to tell us? Well, then I think we can uh, think about dramaturgy as a kind of critical practice of this kind of certain objective objectivity that I'm talking about. So, just to wrap up, I think if we're talking about zapping, well, then we've had a number of... Uh, uh, kind of jumps through cyberspace there where we've gone from the possibility of dramaturgy linking us to the real, linking us to the object, linking us to the ideas of a critical practice, linking us to the world of uh, symposia, discourse and art events. And all of these things I think are certainly activities that are very strongly associated with dramaturgical practice. And then uh, the last big one that we're going to introduce in this panel is dance and dance dramaturgy, but that's uh, another story. So, thank you. <laughs> With that great segue, I'm not going to interrupt. Nanako, would you just take a look at that? Thank you.